I will work day in and day out to wake up and smell the coffee. The independence case is a powerful one. Another future is possible, but we've got to fight for it. Order! Hello and welcome to the Debated Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Will. In this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Heather Wetzel, the Vice Chair of the Labour Land Campaign. Welcome to the podcast, Heather. Thank you very much for having me. It's great to have you on. Um, Now, the first question I'd like to ask is, for those who haven't heard of the Labour Land campaign before, could you just explain what it is? Right, it's a broad left movement. It's not Labour as in Labour Party, though we have Labour Party members, Communist Party, Green Party. Um, So it's a broad left collection of us. It was started in 1984, I think it was, by Dave Wetzel, um, who's advocated um, using land value as um, a form of reforming basic taxes, um, getting rid of bad taxes, distortive taxes, and replacing them with a land value tax. So we're a broad group. We work with others. We started up the Coalition for Economic Justice, and members of that are uh, Liberal Democrats, uh, No Party, Henry George uh, advocates um, who advocated land value tax, um, and, and others. And from that, we also, from that group, um, developed the uh, or initiated the all party parliamentary group on land value tax. This is not a left right issue, it's a right wrong issue. Mm. We differ how we spend the money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, a lot of people listening will have heard of land value added tax before, but for mm. those who haven't, could you just g- give an overview as to what exactly it means and how it differs from the current taxation system? Right. Well, land value tax is actually collecting the economic rent of land. There are three factors in the production of goods and services, and this gets forgotten. There's labour, that's our own labour, whether it's physical or mental, whatever, and capital and land. Land is all natural resources. Land is a gift of nature and has not been produced by any one of us, let alone owners, those who claim ownership to land and other natural resources. But it has a value when we want to use land for housing, for factories, for shops, for public services, for roads, etc., etc. And that value is created by the whole of society, not through ownership. So we say that that economic rent of land, that value of land should be shared through our tax system by collecting um, at least a proportion of that land wealth, uh, which is um, extracted from from the economy by those who claim ownership. And that should be used to replace bad taxes that get avoided, evaded, distort the economy, that cause more damage than good. Um, Certainly we want to keep all green taxes and behavioural taxes that um, help society, but really our tax system is fundamentally flawed. The oldest form of tax actually was was land. Land Mm. was given um, to landowners in return. They could hold it in return for providing the services that were available then, um, including military service, um, funding the king's court, producing food, education, health, as it was then. But landowners had an obligation and they were holders of land. They weren't owners. The monarch actually is the only uh, holder, owner of land, but that's by the by. So today we have those who extract wealth from our economy including landowners and others who who get unearned income, shareholders, etc. They contribute nothing to our economy. Uh, It's the rest of society, real investors, workers, um, local government, national government, providing our public services that we badly need. So it's about using natural resource wealth and replacing bad taxes to have a more efficient, sustainable economy and a fairer economy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you mentioned the, the different um, uses of, of land. There's um, land that is, of course, used for agriculture, for farms, uh, uh, land that's used for building houses, land that's um, used to encourage biodiversity with the environment. In, in terms of policy, how do you think that we can best ensure that when we use land, um, it's in an integrated and constructive way that fulfills all the multiple uses of it, that we don't simply see land as uh, that this is 
purely for housing and we can't have any um, integration of biodiversity there or this is, for example, agricultural land. We can't um, have uh, any housing in a close proximity to it, that kind of thing. A land value tax will make us use land efficiently and sparingly. Um, if we've got a piece of land and we've got to pay um, the percentage of the wealth mm -hmm. from it that we get from it to, to, um, to, the, to the government, then that will make us use that land efficiently. So we won't have idle development sites in our towns and cities that can mm. remain idle for tens of years. Mm. Uh, I live in West London and there's um, a huge area in Brentford that is now being developed, but it was empty buildings, partially used buildings, and it was an eyesore for most of it, um, mm. acres of it for about 30, 40, 50 years, parts of it, mm. and that's now been brought into use. Well, if we had a land value tax, then that land would have been brought into use according to planning, and we need good planning. We need uh, publicly um, driven planning that's good mm. for the local community, not what's good for the developer, um, to use that land efficiently. And with farmland, um, if, if farmers have to pay an... We also advocate including farmland, uh, even though at the moment they get huge subsidies, which actually capitalise yeah. into land mm. value and forces rents up for tenants. Mm. But if land is used more efficiently, farmland, and farmers that only want to use part of their land, you leave the less productive land, either that could be rented out or sold to new entrants into farming, and they need new people, mm -hmm. or it could be rewilded and, and used. But we do need good planning. Mm -hmm. But we, you know, at the moment, our system is we have these idle development sites, we have underused buildings, as office blocks remain empty or only partially used, mm -hmm. they could be used much more efficiently. And instead of building on every blade of grass in our towns and cities and pushing for more development in the countryside, which has all the ills that it brings with it, which includes. Um, more long distance commuting, pollution, road accidents, time wasted, really, where people could be with their families if they could afford to live nearer, nearer their homes. And we wouldn't have this obsession of investing in land or investing in a second home. Mm. These are not investments. These mm. are, are wealth extractions. We have blocks of flats all over the UK that are bought by people as an investment, not as a home. Those, those flats should be there as homes for people. So by having a land value tax, we take out that demand uh, or that desire for speculating in land, and we would use land more efficiently, which would help us environmentally and all the other things that I've said, less long distance commuting and so on. And we'd have more money for, for public services, for better rail links, for better public transport, more affordable, if not free public transport, and going to areas where people at the moment are deprived of public transport. Mm. So there's huge potential benefits economically, socially, and environmentally if we shifted our taxes off of earned incomes and onto the unearned incomes that those who claim ownership to our natural resources take. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and you mentioned um, the subsidies that um farmers uh receive what how much do you think people know about farming subsidies and, and the actual impact that they have on farming and and farm production i i don't know the the i've never i've spoken to individuals mm. i think we probably have um certainly reading the media we have this image that we have to help farmers to produce affordable food and they need that subsidy. But there's a mm. farmer in Scotland called Duncan Pickard and he owns his own farm and he also rents from a retired farmer next door. Mm. And under the subsidy system, Duncan actually pays no rent for that farm next door that he, that he um, mm. rents. Mm. He pays no money over, but that owner the neighbour, he collects the lands, the farming subsidies. So that is Duncan's rent. We pay Duncan's rent. And Duncan argues that farming does not need subsidies. And he goes into it in different books and articles mm. um, where farmers, he argues that farmers do not need subsidies. Um, it would encourage more efficient farming, get rid of the bad taxes that farmers have to, to pay as, as uh, employers. 
Um, but also it would release land for new entrants and for rewilding uh, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So he argues that farmers do not need subsidies. Um, that's a myth. Yeah, yeah. In, in, you, you mentioned um, second homes a moment ago, and that's obviously something that um, a, a lot of people, particularly in rural communities, um, in, in Yorkshire, for example, and, and in Cornwall and in parts of Scotland and Wales, yeah. have, have, com have complained quite a lot about. Mm. What, why, why do you think that we've seen um, this increase in second home ownership? And how best do you think um, we can tackle it and, and make it easier for, for people who live in these areas to actually own homes w where they grew up do you think it's something that can be done better at a, a local level or do you think it's something that the um westminster government has to to step into and, and, and act on right um i'm a homeowner in in west london our house is a very modest house it's an end terrace of four but it's worth something like six hundred thousand pounds now when i die that money will go to my kids They'll have money, they can buy themselves something, or they can invest it in a second home mm. or, or other properties to rent out. And all that does is forces up the prices of properties to rent in those areas where they buy. We lived in Cornwall for five years and we mm. really saw it firsthand there. Having moved down from West London, we had much more money available to spend on a property. We lived in that property, it wasn't a second home. Mm. But we saw the struggle that people who work in local communities there, many of whom only have seasonal work or they work in farming or they work in, in fishing industry and they cannot afford to rent, let alone buy. Mm. So where we have high land values, that's, that's an advantage for those people who own their own homes. Uh, but of course, as land values go up, as the economy um, improves, Land prices go up. Now, the value of my asset, my house, and the land that goes with it goes up in value. My neighbour, a few doors along, their rent goes up. Their tenants, mm. they don't benefit from rising land prices. They're penalised. Mm. So it's a problem all over. But in those areas where second homes, of course, it's the ongoing things with their sick, if people aren't living there, so they're not using the local mm. shop, the kids aren't going to local school. Those communities are dying. And people who've lived in villages and, and towns in those areas uh, for generations, they're denied the opportunity now because they can't afford to live or rent there. Um, wages are low, as I said, there's a lot of seasonal work. So people are being forced out of villages uh, mm. and it's terrible. Um, it's, it's a real crime and it's a real shame. But it's only something like 40% of adults actually own a home mm. in the UK. The rest are tenants or li live with parents or other family members. Mm. And of course, there's an increasing number of young adults, not just in their 20s and 30s, but also in their 40s, who, who are forced to live with their family mm. for financial reasons. They can't afford the, the down payment for a mortgage. They can't afford rents in the area that they need to need to live in to get to to get to their work mm -hmm. yeah absolutely um in terms of, of of land ownership in different countries in, in in places outside the uk do you think there are any lessons that we can learn for how di different countries approach um land ownership and, and maybe some things that are implemented in 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 other countries that would possibly be a good idea to to bring in in the uk yeah, I think we can look to many countries that actually collect land wealth. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of Hong Kong. Um, they have low taxes on, on earned incomes, but they collect land wealth uh, through their system because land is not owned uh, historically. Um, I think it was just the Church of England um, owned a plot of land, but the rest was rented out or leased mm -hmm. out. And the rent from that land is, uh, is used to pay for their metro system, capital expenditure, as well as revenue, uh, their new airport, not so new, new now, but their airport and other services. Now they don't have an ideal sort of economy that I would like because mm -hmm. I'd want more uh, money put into housing, et cetera, but that's how you spend the money. But the way they spend the money, the way they get their money is actually from land ownership. Um, similarly in China, but unfortunately China, sold leases 
70, 80 year leases. But over the you know, recent years, China's mm. economy is, has rocketed. And so have their land values. And they now have land market because they're not collecting the rent of land. They should be having an annual land value tax on the rental value of land. Mm. So they're keeping up, they're using it. And at the moment, cities are selling off land uh, to pay for revenue expenditure. So they're running out of land to, to, to pay for paying their staff. Um, they've got it wrong. But in this country, if you look at the city of London, they own swathes of land, um, have done for yonks, and they use that land for paying for their services, including um, there's a um, the Bridges Trust, and that wealth goes into, into the Bridges Trust, which pays for, I'm not sure how many bridges there are in the centre of London. You know, that's an historical thing. They provide mm. the new bridges, they maintain them and build them, rebuild them when they need them, uh, not the general taxpayer. So land wealth is used throughout the world um, I know in Germany that there's an area they're looking at uh, shifting to a land value tax in Holland. Um, um, uh, again, in Denmark, they had a land value tax uh, for years. And on oil, if you look at Alaska, they, they um, have um, um, an, an oil benefit. I can't remember what it's called now, but it's where a dividend paid out to every uh, resident, adult and child. Um, they get a, a, a share every year, and that can be as much as two, three thousand dollars per head, mm. because it's a part of the oil, which is natural wealth, uh, goes into that fund. Uh, no great socialists there, but they're using land wealth. Mm. Um, similarly, in, in Norway, they have a scheme, but there are examples around where uh, land is shared. But of course, so often land is just exploited. Those people who claim ownership. As their economy, their country's economy grows, then those landowners hold the country to ransom and say, if you want to use my land for homes, for businesses, for whatever else, public services, you've got to pay me a fortune before I let you use my land. Sorry, but land is a product of nature. It's a gift of nature and we should mm. share it and share the economic and other benefits that we get from land. Uh, it shouldn't be held in private ownership, in my view, but if it is, I accept that system here. I ain't going to change that now. But certainly land wealth should be shared by the whole of society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, in regards to um, the increases that people have seen in their energy bills, one of the things that has resulted from that has been people realising that uh, a, a lot of the natural resources in Britain in terms of uh, wind and tidal, which could be utilised better uh, to, to produce energy, are, aren't being um, harnessed at the moment. Do you think that we're going to see in the next year and, and, in, and in forthcoming years a greater emphasis on homegrown renewables and, and a greater promotion of using uh, the, the, the natural um, benefits that can be gained in, in terms of renewables that are, are so plentiful in the UK advocated more for? Do you, do you think we're going to see a, a greater push for renewables in the UK? I certainly hope that is the case. Um, I'd like to think that there's going to be a safe world for my grandchildren, great grandchildren and for other peoples uh, for the future. Um, we have to move that direction. But of course, again, you're talking about natural resources and we need to not just harness those natural resources and use them to benefit to re to, for renewable energy and that, but we also need to use the income, the natural wealth that exists there because of those natural resources and our demand for them um, that creates that natural resource wealth. That should be, that too should be captured and used to invest in good things like renewables, um, like decent homes for, for everybody, whether they want to rent or buy, um, like um, more local production of goods and services and more local production of food. Um, I love it when I read about community nurseries where they're growing food um, on a shared basis or, you know, I think those, those systems are wonderful. But if we can reduce transporting food around the country in lorries, then there'll be tremendous benefits there. But it's about using our natural resources efficiently that benefit us all, both 
on the on the economic and social level, but also on the on on the environmental level, but also to use that natural resource wealth to benefit everybody and not to benefit those that claim ownership. When we see um, wind farms, I, I love seeing the windmills. I know mm. you know, they're a bit like Marmite, aren't they? You love more <laughs> hate them, but I love seeing them. Mm. And but I know that the owners of those of the farmland that rents out for those turbines, they're getting an enormous amount of money. Uh, because they say, if you want to use my land, you've got to pay me a fortune. Well, that should not be. If it's wanted by the local community, then it should be shared by the local community. Mm -hmm. And that that wealth should be shared by all. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I'm just thinking in terms of um, the, the past and particularly um, the, the past of the Labour Party. One of the interesting things um, about Keir Hardy is his relationship with um, Henry George and Henry George's ideas. Do you think that this is a part of um, Keir Hardy and a part of the Labour Party's past that has been somewhat overlooked, that, that going back to the very um, beginnings of the Labour Party, there were clear uh, advocacies from, from Keir Hardy and others for um, land to be used in a way that benefited um, the great mass of people? Oh, absolutely, yes. I mean, it was Labour Party policy uh, to collect land wealth. And it was um, actually there was an act implemented, but uh, before the war, um, I'm not an expert on it. I need to talk to somebody else, but it was actually um, not implemented because they had the coalition uh, government and they mm. abolished it straight away. Um, and I think that's from our selfishness. It's very difficult today to get to talk to politicians in particular about um, sharing land wealth. And I think that's because they see their own properties going up and they're more concerned about their kids' inheritance or their second home or whatever they, you know, and their own asset going up rather than what is right morally and economically and environmentally, i.e. using land wealth. Um, I did say it's not a left-right issue. Um, and of course the Lib Dems um, have a, a policy um, certainly reforming business rates to replace them with a, with a land value tax. Um, in the last election, it was Green Party policy, Lib Dem policy, Scottish Nats policy, Labour Party policy, to actually look at using land, shifting to a land value tax mm. uh, away from uh, business rates and council tax, looking to replace them. And that would be a huge start. It isn't the answer because other taxes distort the economy and unfair. Um, can be avoided and evaded, and they certainly are, especially by the super rich. Um, but yes, it was Labour Party policy, and unfortunately, um, the, the decision makers in the Labour Party today um, are not looking at, at, at that to revive that policy as part of Labour Party. And that seems to have got lost. So Jeremy Corbyn, John McDonnell had it um, in the last manifesto. Um, but I think, you know, they're missing something. And when we talk of a wealth tax, over 50%, something like 60% of UK wealth, according to the Office of National Statistics, is actually in land, mm. over 6 billion. And if we use that as our basis for tax, um, it would be have a huge advantage. Mm -hmm. um, but we talk about natural, uh, about um, windfall tax, we talk about uh, a wealth tax, we, I want a, an annual um, windfall tax by collecting natural resource wealth um, and not taxing people's wages, uh, not in taxing good investment. Um, you know, we need to look at we need to look at history and see why we've moved to this crazy system of taxing incomes, mm. earned incomes and not taxing unearned incomes, even to the same degree. Well, um, it's been great speaking to you, Heather. Thank you very much for um, taking the time to um, come on the podcast and, and, and speak to me. If people want to find out more about um, the Labour land campaign, where should they go to, to find out more about the campaign and um, potentially join or, or support it if they'd like to? Yeah, we've got a, we've got a website. It's um, labourland.org. Um, but if you Google labour and land value then then you it'll almost certainly come up 
Um, but we welcome discussion, debate. We have speakers go out to different meetings. Um, you know, we, we have discussions and we lobby. Um, so we would welcome um, discussion, debate with people. And we certainly welcome new members, especially younger people. Um, if they can contact us through, through our website, that would be great. Fantastic. Thank you once again for coming on the podcast. Okay. Thank you very much, Will. Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. If you've enjoyed it, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, Podbeam, and Amazon Music. You can also follow us on Twitter, at Debated Podcast, like us on Facebook, Debated Podcast, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, whether about appearing on an episode of the podcast, or commenting on an episode that you've listened to, you can do so at the Debated Podcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you listen to the next one.